It's great to be in the SEC. Welcome back to the SEC Recap Podcast for the Week 6 Power Rankings episode, reacting to Week 5. I am your host, Ben Warren. As always, a lot to talk about. Thank you for tuning in once again. If you're here on YouTube, you get to take advantage of seeing all these graphics and, and stats and stuff that I put out for you guys every week. As always, those are on Twitter or on X, on my website as well. Always get those updated um, by late Sunday. Uh, if not before, um, we're talking efficiency charts, power rankings, uh, quarterback ratings, all that stuff. You're going to see it all today. So thank you for being here on YouTube. If you're not already subscribed, go ahead and subscribe to the channel, please, please, please. Uh, smash that like, smash that thumbs up, drop a comment on the video. It just helps me out. I appreciate you guys. Uh, these power rankings episodes have been wildly successful this season. So I'm going to continue to crank them out for you all. Uh, but if you're joining us in audio form, uh, you know, YouTube Music has video podcasts, Spotify has video podcasts. You can check us out in that form over there. But if you're listening purely uh, to my audio aesthetic, thank you very much. I always appreciate you for being here. However you prefer to chug your podcast, I always appreciate you here at the SEC Recap Pod. Don't forget to check out the merch, bonfire.com slash store slash SEC Recap. You can donate to the pod right up there. And I think I'm gonna gonna change up the order a little bit this week, guys. I think what I'm gonna do um, is start with the power rankings. I always try to do like some little stat dives to set up the rankings. I'm gonna swap that. I know a lot of people uh, got a little bit of feedback. People are here for the power rankings. You just want to see where your team rates and what I have to say about them. So um, I'm gonna humor you all. I'm gonna do that up front in this episode. So. We'll go straight into the power ratings, and then I will talk a little bit of game breakdown. Not like a film breakdown. This isn't that that kind of episode. Uh, this is purely to talk the power ratings model and to jump into a little bit of the data and the stats that go into that and do a little bit of predictive, uh, predictive work as well to kind of see what we can expect from certain teams moving forward. Uh, you know, those teams who might be outliers in the SEC. Uh, so with that being said, let me see if I got it up here. And there we are. All right, guys, jumping into the power ratings, staying at number 16 this week, uh, where I believe they've been for the last, uh, two or three weeks is your Mississippi state bulldogs. Um, Blake Shapin gets hurt in week four. They're now in their backup. I believe Michael Van Buren jr. Um, and he's doing the best he can, right? Uh, but to give you an idea, he was my uh, last ranked quarterback of this week uh, in that game against Texas. I had him graded out at, at a 104.77 passing efficiency ranking. That was 11 out of the 11 quarterbacks who played. Uh, 12 of 23, 144 yards, no touchdowns, no interceptions. Uh, I mean, they played Texas uh, by comparison, Arch Manning. He was my second graded quarterback of the weekend, 171.88. So just a huge, huge talent discrepancy there at the quarterback position. Um, they did put up 13 points, uh, but Texas takes that game 35, 13. Arch Manning throws for 324. Um, Mississippi State did total 150 on the ground. Kind of surprised to see that. Um and the 144 through the air. So some positive things still happening there for the Bulldogs, but uh, overall, I think you got to kind of count this season as a wash. Take the best that you can from it uh, and look forward to that rebuild next year. At the number 15 spot, falling to coming off a loss at home to Oklahoma, just kind of the latest in a... Uh, in a you know a string of uh, unfortunate incidents there on the plane, uh, the Auburn Tigers. Um, now this is the biggest movement in the model that I saw over the weekend, right? If you've been kind of hanging with me through these episodes, we've seen some pretty big swings. We've seen some teams jump three, drop four as the kind of that middle eight or nine teams sort of jockeys for position. Those values are really really close. Uh, this was the biggest move of the weekend. Auburn falling too, right? Um, let me find this game here. So Oklahoma takes this uh, 27, 
to 21 final score, but that came off of 17 fourth quarter points uh, for the Sooners. Michael Hawkins Jr. looking much better. Um, Peyton Thorne, three touchdowns, but throwing the interception. This one looked all but in hand for Auburn. And then the Oklahoma offense finds a way, right? Which, um, you know, we didn't know, especially after that Tennessee win in Norman, how many wins Oklahoma could, you know, maybe reasonably expect to come away with this season. But um, I think they steal one there on the Plains. This, this game was Auburn's. It was theirs to win. It was theirs to lose. And they lost it. The, the story is the same for the Auburn Tigers. It's turnovers. Um, inopportune turnovers, not not capitalizing. Their, their offensive efficiency metrics, uh, offensive deficiency metrics are, are actually reasonably solid. We'll look at those after I go through the power ratings. I don't want to sidetrack here. Um, the name of the game for them is turnovers, man. Turning the ball over. Just can't do it. Can't do it. Um, jumping again back to the 14 spot this week, the Vanderbilt Commodores, by the way, thank you for tuning in. Whoever you are, appreciate you being here on a Tuesday morning. I'm going to keep rolling. Uh, Vanderbilt Commodores jumping a spot, uh, to number 14. They... Uh, did not play this week, but uh, the model, I think after dropping Auburn two, um, looked at the numbers and moved Vanderbilt just ahead of them. I can kind of tell you the value here. I'm not going to pop it on screen, um, but Auburn graded out in my model at a 29.54. Vanderbilt just ahead of them at 29.87. So the model doesn't punish you for not playing. It does punish you for losing in certain fashion. So that's why you see Vanderbilt overtake Auburn here in the week six ratings. Uh, also jumping a spot, again, a team that did not play. They were on a bye, but the Florida Gators moving up into the 13 spot, kind of for a two or three weeks there, looking like one of the bottom teams in the SEC. I still think they are. The Florida Graders grayed out in my model as a 31.82. So that's just um, a couple points ahead of Vanderbilt. Again, Model doesn't punish you for not playing, but it really did not like what it saw from the Auburn Tigers. So it moves Vanderbilt and Florida just ahead of Auburn this week. Um, falling spot. Again, another team who did not play, uh, but the South Carolina Gamecocks. They grayed out at a 45.73, so well ahead of Florida. The 12-13 here in my rankings are not close. Um not really at all. I, in fact, on a neutral field, I would pick South Carolina to probably be like a field goal favorite, um, at least maybe a little bit more than that, maybe even a four point favorite, just depending. Um, but I think they do get Lenora Sellers back headed into this week. This is not a, a week. This is not a week six preview pod. So I'm going to hold off on those kind of projections, anything like that. But um, I think they do get Lenora Sellers back. Um, that's, I, I believe, going to be a little boost for their offense moving forward. Rob, Robbie Ashford wasn't bad in their last game, but um, you know Lenora Sellers is their guy. So we'll see what that looks like for the Gamecocks um, moving forward. Uh, coming off a big win. Now, I can kind of sense the pushback on this one. At number 11, the Kentucky Wildcats, they jump a spot. Um, after getting thumped by the Gamecocks in week two, you thought, you know, what the hell's going on there in Lexington? They had a close game uh, against Georgia at home. They That was a winnable game for them. They, well, they blew it. I mean, there's no other way to put it. They blew that game. Um, coaching personnel, whatever you want to call it. And then they go on the road to the number six team in the country, Ole Miss, and pull out the road upset, uh, which this was an afternoon game. Noon game or afternoon game, I can't remember. I, I caught the tail end of this one because I was at a music festival all weekend. Uh, but I caught this one. Um, I just don't think Ole Miss was ready. We'll talk more about the Rebels when I get to them and the power rankings. But I just don't think Ole Miss was truly up and ready for this game. That's not a tough environment to play in. It's just not. It's not scary. In fact, when you kind of handicap games, you know, uh, all these power ratings are based on, you know, what would happen on a neutral site. But you're... You're always going to give the home team anywhere between maybe two and three points, just depending on atmosphere and environment. Uh, you know, Vaught Hemingway is going to be on the lower end of that. So when I'm handicapping, 
you know, something like Kentucky at Ole Miss. I'm not giving Ole Miss three, which would be the value that I would sign for like a, a game at Neyland Stadium at night, right? Alabama 2022. That would be a that would be a three for the home team, minus three. Uh Vaughn Hemingway is more like a two, maybe a one and a half for a noon game during the day. You know, uh it, it's just not that intimidating. So uh 20 to 17, the final score here. Kentucky wins by a field goal. Ole Miss misses the field goal to tie it to send this into overtime. I think it goes wide left. Um, you you gotta like what you see there. Jackson Dart graded out um probably the worst he's graded out in my quarterback ratings all week. Um, he came in as my number five quarterback, 18 of 27, 261, and a single touchdown. He's a 147.99. He's always been like in that top three, one, two, or three. Um, so for him to kind of fall to the middle of the pack there is a huge step back for him. Brock Vandegriff played well enough. I'll say 18 to 28, 243, uh, one touchdown, no interceptions. He was a, a, a 120, let's see, 137.3 uh, in my rating. So that was number seven overall. So a couple spots behind. Jackson Dart there. Um, good for Kentucky. Biggest like road win in most Kentucky fans' lifetime there. So um cool to see. Really cool to see. Uh falling to uh the number 10 spot, just one uh dropping one spot to the number 10 spot. Blah, can't talk this morning. The Arkansas Razorbacks, uh, they do lose to Texas AM. Uh, I think final year of this neutral site game at Jerry World. Um, I think this game is going to be moved back to the campuses, which I think is awesome. Um, Arkansas should get to play at Kyle Field, um, and the Aggies should get to play there at Fayetteville. Um, both teams statistically pretty solid. I think the story of this game is Arkansas just couldn't run the ball. Um, Taylor Green, 279 yards through the air, one touchdown, one interception. In my quarterback rankings, he was near the bottom. He was number nine out of 11, 23 of 41. Um, 113.29 uh, in my QB ratings. They just put up 100 yards total on the ground. Um, that included Green holding the ball six times or 13 times for just six total yards there. They did manage to throw for the 279. Uh, four fumbles, though. They lost two of those. Uh, Texas A&M recovered to those momentum swings in a close game will always get you. It's a story of Auburn, right? Same thing. Statistically, offensive metrics look great. Efficiency metrics look great, except for the fact that you're turning the ball over like two and a half times a game. You just can't do that. A&M, uh, Marcel Reed, 163 through the air, two touchdowns. He was actually my number 10 quarterback of the week. So I think he played better than Taylor Green, but he graded out just a little worse. And I think it's that 11 of 22 stat line. 133 on or sorry 134 on the ground there for AM. Um 10 tackles for loss, you know, being able to live behind the line of scrimmage. Uh that's what you want to see in this league. Uh if you can win the turnover battle, win the line of scrimmage, you're probably going to fare pretty well, especially when it's a close matchup like that. You know, a AM and Arkansas don't grade out. There's not a huge difference there. I think AM was like four point favorites in this game. So that final point spread there tracks for me um jumping a spot after a road win on the plains oklahoma uh they bump up to number nine this week uh i've got them in my model at a 53.69 that's just ahead of arkansas at a 50.26 so three almost three and a half point spread there between the nine and the ten spot just to give you an idea um, I already talked about this game a little bit. This is Auburn's game to lose. Oklahoma did what they needed to do there in the fourth quarter to win it. Um, Michael Hawkins Jr. kind of sparking that offense. Looking more and more like Jackson Arnold's time there could be done, uh, and he'll be headed to the portal soon. So um, that completes the back nine. You're not going to see as much movement, guys, in the top half of this. So I want to pause here real quick um, just to kind of plug my merch store, bonfire.com slash store slash SEC recap. If you've not headed over there and checked out the designs, please do. I've got something there for everybody, including a new lineup I'm working on called the Saturday Series. Um, 
I'm trying to get all that artwork finalized and uploaded for these new shirts. But I've got something for every team except Texas and Oklahoma. Uh, they will be in my new new Saturdays lineup, um, including some fun stuff, right? Um, my personal favorite, the Big Doink Energy Tea. I have one for myself. I sport it on the podcast from time to time. Um, guys, show your love for Big Doinks with the Big Doink Energy Tea. It comes in a variety of colors, T-shirt, long sleeve, pullover, hoodie, um, Everything is that super soft premium cotton. The designs look great. All the shirts and the merch are going to feel great. So head on over to bonfire.com slash store slash SEC recap uh, and check that stuff out. I greatly, greatly, greatly appreciate it. All right, let's crack the top half of the SEC here. At the number eight spot, they do fall. Now, I know you're going to think this is weird. They fall a spot even though they won. They were number seven. They fall to number eight. But it's not huge movement, guys. I, I harp on this all the time when we'll we'll look at how my model stacks up to some others. These are not big movement. We're talking about like a point, maybe two points that separates, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay. Um, so Aggies did what they needed to do. You did good. The model is not punishing the Aggies here. Um, it's just looking at the teams that grade out a little higher for certain reasons and saying, this is where you should be. This is how you would fare in a neutral site matchup versus some of these other teams. Okay. Um, so Aggie's got a big, you know, I think a big home game versus Mizzou coming up. That'll be a top 25 matchup because the Aggies crack the top 25 in the AP this week. So Mizzou, I think still sitting in that top 10. Number nine, I think. So we get a nine on 25 matchup. That should be the only ranked SEC matchup of the weekend. Excited to dive into that one. I'll preview that one later in the week. Don't want to side rail too much there. Uh, jumping a spot, kind of overtaking the Aggies here at the number seven because they had a uh, huge win margin over South Alabama. That's the LSU Tigers. Uh, when we get into SEC play, guys, it's harder for me to spend time like on LSU beating South Alabama by, you know, 30, 32 points. It is what it is. LSU is a top 15 team. South Alabama is South Alabama. Nothing against that squad. This is just a huge mismatch, right? Garrett Nussmeyer throws for 409. Like, uh, LSU was not losing this game. Now, Talk about LSU because when you look at their offensive defensive defensive efficiency stats, I'll show you guys on a chart here after I finish the power rankings. Uh, they're in some suspicious company. Okay. They're a little bit of an outlier in the SEC and not in a good way. So um I'm I'm tempering expectations for LSU moving forward rest of season. Uh we'll dive into that a little bit more here in just a few minutes. Now, really not a lot of change in the top six here. So I'm going to breeze through these pretty quickly. Uh, Mizzou did not play this week. Uh, so the model doesn't move them at all. They stay at number six. However, this is where we start to see larger point gaps between teams. So um, LSU is a 59.56. Mizzou is a 60 even. Okay. Once we jump to number five here, the spreads between five to six and four to five and three to four get larger and larger and larger, all right? Um, because the talent gap at the top of the SEC is exceptionally larger than what we see in the middle and the bottom of the SEC. Um, Ole Miss, they do lose to Kentucky. However, the model does not drop them. I think largely due to some of the strength that Kentucky showed and how much higher they were graded out already in the model versus some of those other teams. So the model looks at that and says that loss at home versus Kentucky is not significant enough uh, to, to drop you below Mizzou or below LSU. The model still thinks Ole Miss is 17 points better than Mizzou and about 18 points better than LSU, just to give you an idea. Uh, number four, again, they lose the, the game of the week, the game of the year. A lot of people are calling it to Alabama. I'm going to talk a little bit of this one here at the end, uh, but the Georgia Bulldogs don't move. Uh, they stay at number four. It was a road environment, mounted the comeback really close, close loss there on the road. Um, they rate out three, no, sorry, 11 points better than Ole Miss. 11 points better. That's how big the gap between four and five is, y'all. 
11 points better than Ole Miss. Um, staying at the number three spot, they did not play this week, but the Tennessee Volunteers, so again, model doesn't punish you for not playing. It doesn't see any reason to bump or drop. So Tennessee is going to stay just ahead of Georgia, and this is a small point spread, guys. Georgia rated out this week at an 88.44, Tennessee at an 88.53 in the SEC recap model. So that one, extremely, extremely, extremely close. All right, so they held the number one spot for two or three weeks there. The Texas Longhorns, the model drops them to the number two spot. Uh, so just one position, nothing that they did wrong. They handled business against Mississippi State. Uh, but the team that came in number one overall, I think, is deserving this week. So again, these this is not my gut feeling. This is not how I feel about any certain team. These are objective metrics that anybody can look at and compare. Alabama Crimson Tide are this week's number one overall team in the SEC recap ratings. And how can you not have them number one? Uh, along with that, let me just talk about this. Jalen Milrow was my number one rated quarterback of the week as well. Uh, 27 of 33 for 374 yards, two touchdowns, and a pick. Um, that's an 81.8% completion rating. He graded out at a 177.16. That is one of the highest ratings of the season uh, of any week. Um, a few weeks we've had some like against cupcakes. You know, some some quarterbacks have gone over two hundred, but against that competition, against Georgia, to rate out at a one seventy seven, that is phenomenal. So Jalen Milrow continues to be that dude. He added, he added 117 yards and two touchdowns on the ground. Um, that's a Heisman candidate right there, guys. That's a Heisman candidate. Um, you looked at the quarterback on the other side of the ball, Carson Beck. It's not even close. Carson Beck was my number eight quarterback. 27 of 50, guys. 54% completion rating, three touchdowns, three interceptions. He was a 127. So a 50-point difference in my quarterback ratings there between Milrow and Beck. Carson Beck's a good player, but, you know, best quarterback on the best team. A lot of people were talking about him as that guy, you know, as, as a, a Heisman front runner. And, boy, after week five, I just do not see it. It, it really looks like it's Jalen Milrow. Um, at least out of the SEC in that category for me. Um, it's hard to find someone who looked better than he did on Saturday. Ryan Williams is a dude. Everybody's been talking about him. Six for 177 and a uh, a long of 75 there. Everybody's talking about that 75-yard uh, run that he had. He also had a fumble. But, you know, you go six for 177, people aren't going to talk about that fumble as much. Uh, they're going to talk about your long tutties. So, um, Alabama sitting at the top of the SEC this week, deservedly so. Um, I don't know how you could have anybody else there. If you're Texas, I get your argument. You didn't lose, so why would it punish you? But it's the quality of that win. One of the things that my model factors in is your strength of record. So as we get into SEC play, it's those head-to-head -head matchups, right, which are factored into your strength of record. So Alabama at this point, I think, unquestionably has the best win of the season. I know Mich or Texas wants to argue that road win over Michigan, and that was a dominant win, not taking anything away from that win. But uh, you beat the number, you know, two team or whatever at home, uh, or number four team at home, like in that fashion, that kind of excitement. I know it was close there at the end, but, you know, Alabama's up 28, 28 nothing at halftime. So they showed what they're capable of. They showed that dominance. Credit to Georgia, though, for coming back. Not a lot of teams can do that, especially on the road. Still think Georgia is a very good team. Guys, just a little heads up. Think about that weekend that we have coming up the third Saturday in October. Now, a lot of people know that as Tennessee-Bama weekend. But that same weekend, we also get Georgia on the road at Texas, we could potentially have y'all the number one versus number four and the number two versus number five games back to back. One of those is going to be the night game. One of them is going to be the, the afternoon game. 
Um, I honestly, right now, I'd put my money on uh, Bama, Tennessee being the night game. Um, just with Georgia having the loss now and playing on the road at Texas again. But that is going to be an absolute banger of a weekend. Cannot wait for that. Guys, that rounds out the power rankings, but this episode is not done. I'm going to dive into those stats. So those of you who are here for the stats, who are here for the numbers, we're going to talk about those here in just a minute. There's the final rankings. That is on my website, guys, secrecap.com slash stats. I also post it on Twitter every Sunday, Monday. Um, when the model updates. Okay. So head on over there, check that out. Let's talk about the stat dives here because it's always worth jumping into these and I'm going to make these larger. I'm going to make myself smaller. I'm going to get out of the way. Let me, let me hide my tickers here so we can see everything nice and clear. There we go. So, um, the charts that I post weekly, uh, EPA per play on a weekly basis and season averages, right? Just to kind of give you an idea of how your team stacks up offensively and defensively versus other teams in the conference, also versus the conference average. So where you want to be is this bottom right quadrant, okay? Um, coming out of week five, the teams that we had there are Texas and LSU. Of course, think about the level of competition that both of those teams played. Texas played Mississippi State who is statistically uh, you know, the worst team in the SEC. You can even look at their offensive def if defensive efficiency metrics up there. It's the exact opposite. So this bottom right quadrant is quadrant one. That's elite. This top left quadrant is quadrant four. That's the worst quadrant. And then we, you're always going to have a cluster of teams around the conference averages, right? So defense, you want that to trend negative. Um, and offense, you want to trend you know, as, as positive as possible. So here, here's your week five offensive and defensive efficiencies. Um, Georgia, Alabama, due to level at competition, that is going to skew everything toward or pull everything toward the uh, the middle. The average is there. Same thing, Kentucky and Auburn, Oklahoma, Ole Miss. Those teams kind of give us our average there. And then we've got your more elite outliers from week five, Texas, LSU, um, Arkansas, really strong showing defensively there. Just... Um, couldn't come up with it when it mattered against AM. AM statistically an outlier. You look at that game, that game probably should have gone Arkansas's way. Um, they were better defensively and they were better offensively. But um, what happens in the game? Well, Texas AM recovered two turnovers. Um, and turning the ball over is uh, one of the highest statistical correlations to wins and losses that there is in football. And then you have Mississippi, which is the um, garbage doo-doo outlier there up in the top left. Let's compare that to some season averages. Um, so again, I update this weekly. So this is current through week five. You'll see all the teams, not just the teams that played in week five, kind of taking on this Christmas tree-like effect. But same quadrants here. Bottom right is your elite quadrant. Now, Ole Miss has taken a loss now. So they kind of stand as an outlier here. They're now a one-loss team, but they graded out so high through four weeks of not playing anyone um, that that average is not going to start to be skewed until they play consistently strong competition, which is coming up for them here very soon. Um, your elite teams defensively and offensively continue to be Tennessee, Texas, Alabama, uh, as far as your undefeateds. Then we have our cluster around the averages. Uh, some things here to note. South Carolina, right? Uh, one loss team, uh, Georgia now a one loss team, Arkansas, a two loss team, Vanderbilt, two loss team, Missouri. What are you doing there? Mizzou Tigers. Let's talk about you for a minute. Mizzou is a undefeated team that statistically is kind of in the company of these one and two loss clusters here. Now, Georgia is a, is a one loss team. Um, so not talking about them yet. This is sort of to be expected here. Mizzou is kind of below where you would expect an undefeated team in the SEC to be in terms of offensive EPA and defensive EPA. So they travel to Texas A&M in week six to play the Aggies. Um, Aggies are not far outside of that cluster. So really interesting setup here. Mizzou has looked okay against Boston College. They almost lost to Vanderbilt, a team that is also in this cluster. So what does that tell you predictively, guys? I'm just saying if I had to handicap that matchup, Mizzou on the road at AM, 
I would have Mizzou as an underdog in that game. I would actually favor AM probably by a couple points. Um, and I can show you exactly how to do that. You can do that right from my website. Scroll down, you can see how my model stacks up against something like the FPI, which is commonly used for handicapping. Um, here's what you do. So find one team. So Mizzou, they're rating out at a 60. I'm just going to multiply by 100 here. It's 0. 0.6, but I'll just do 60. Minus A&M's value, which is 58.44. Gives you a 1.56. Then what you're going to do is divide, guys, by 2.5 which is going to give you a 0.624. And then you're going to handicap the value. Now, what time is that game? That's going to be an 11 a.m. kickoff in Kyle Field. So that's going to be a two and a half Kyle Field. That's a, that's a tough place to play. Good home environment there. But it's a noon kickoff, right? So that's going to be a two and a half that you're going to subtract from Mizzou's point value there. Or sorry, we're going to add. Um, so I would have Mizzou as a three point, this comes out to 3.124. I would have Mizzou as a three point underdog on the road in a &M. It looks like a and or sorry, ESPN has a &M favored by two. So we're really, really close there. Um, basically a field goal difference. Um, that final handicap for home field advantage might look a little different just depending on who's doing the numbers. So for me, I would have Mizzou a field goal underdog on the road. Um, so interesting there to watch out for. Let me get back to that. Um, statistically, look at Oklahoma versus Auburn, right? That was Auburn's game to lose. You had Oklahoma kind of come in and steal that one. Biggest statistical mismatch of the weekend, right? Based on these, Kentucky over Ole Miss. Based on this, it should never happen, but sometimes when the breaks go your way, you can capitalize. Um, what I continue to harp on about LSU, y'all, is where they fall in this company. And that's kind of in the company of, of Florida and Mississippi State. The, your worst teams offensively, well, not offensively, but definitely the worst teams defensively in the SEC um, and just kind of at or just below the conference average in terms of offensive EPA. LSU is right there in that cluster, and that's not that's not what you want to see, right? Um, that's not what you want to see. LSU gets a bye week this week, so they're safe, but then they jump into conference play where they got Ole Miss coming to town. And Ole Miss is still a good team. I know they got beat at home by Kentucky. But that's still going to be a good team coming to Baton Rouge at night. Okay? Um, so this doesn't forebode well to me. When I'm, when I'm looking at, you know, where they sit relative to your top teams in the conference, LSU is a one-loss team. Statistically, looking at this, should be a two- or three-loss team. And so I think that number in the loss column is going to play catch up here really quickly as we move into the middle and back half of the season. Okay. Um, I really, really do. Let's look at uh, the offensive efficiency numbers on the season. Again, I have those broken down weekly. You can see LSU is very, very good. Texas, very, very good. Alabama, very, very good. Look at the gap between Alabama and Georgia here, y'all, in terms of yards per rush, yards per pass. Um, another one of those metrics that correlates really highly to win totals is uh, rushing efficiency. Yards per rush, turnover margin, and defensive efficiency. Those correlate really highly with win totals. Alabama had the rushing game over Georgia. Guys, how long has it been since we've looked at this and say that Georgia couldn't run the ball? I mean, averaging just better than three yards per carry on this Alabama defense. Georgia has always had tailbacks. We used to call them tailback U. Georgia has always been able to run the ball. They couldn't run the ball. Carson Beck had to throw 50 times. Carson Beck from Georgia had to throw 50 times to come back against Alabama. Guys, the team that runs the ball will typically win. Look at Oklahoma-Auburn. Statistically, offensive, defensively, right? That looked like a huge mismatch. It looked like Oklahoma should never stand a chance against Auburn. But look at the rushing efficiency. Oklahoma ran the ball better than Auburn. 
correlates really highly with win totals, guys. Correlates really highly with win totals. Let's look at your elite teams. That continues to be Tennessee, Alabama, Ole Miss, Auburn. Weird. I mean, just bizarre that Auburn is still in this category with Tennessee, Texas, Alabama, Ole Miss, and they're losing games. Um, Man, it's just that that's a really bizarre. That's a bizarre place to be. Um, you know, near last in the SEC. Um, but, but on the season performing, you know, uh, above the conference average in yards per pass yards per rush, um, Georgia LSU sit right at the conference average. Some of your low outliers will continue to be Mississippi state, Kentucky, Oklahoma. Those, those offenses continue to struggle, but that's not what the way they play, right? Those teams aren't playing for shootouts. They're playing to kind of slow the other team down turtle it out um, and kind of create uh, some havoc, cre create some turnover opportunities there. So I always like to point out these stats, y'all. Um, they're worth taking a look at. Uh, they start to solidify now that we're into conference play and when all these teams are playing each other. So you're going to see all of these teams start to trend in toward the middle there with a few outliers, but those outliers will tend to be your elite, like who's the very best of the best. And then who's the very worst of the worst as we see everybody else start to come toward the middle. We want to start to pay pay attention to who who stands out on either sides of those spectrums. So um, I'm just going to cap it there, guys. We got this one done a little bit faster today because I started with the power ratings instead of the stat dives. So we're going to end this one before the 45-minute cutoff mark. Thank you once again for being here. Um, I appreciate you as always. I will be back with you to preview... Um, you know, Mizzou at Texas A&M. Um, who else we got here? I should have had this pulled up. I thought I had this pulled up already. Ah, uh, Auburn at Georgia, Ole Miss at South Carolina, Alabama at Vanderbilt, Tennessee at Arkansas. Um, and then we got a Florida matchup, UCF at Florida. Um, that'll be the Thursday episode. I'll be back for a live stream and then put that out in podcast form. Y'all are beautiful. Y'all have a great week. I'll catch you on the next one. Peace.